Hey, it's Matt Pinfield. Welcome to In a Lonely Place. This is my show that I'm doing from my living room. You know, I named the show after a song by a band from my area that I was friends with like from the get-go, from the very beginning, named the Smithereens. And Pat Denizio, who was the main songwriter in that band, wrote this beautiful song. It was a duet with Suzanne Vega, where he actually took some of the dialogue from the movie In a Lonely Place from 1950 with Humphrey Bogart. And, you know, I always loved that record. So I thought, you know what, we're, a lot of us are isolated by ourselves, but we're never totally alone because we're able to stay in touch with each other. And, you know, friends, family, and music are the things that absolutely get you through this. So we're doing this for Music Cares, and I want to thank all the sponsors that are involved, Taylor Guitars, Roland Wah Music. I love doing this because it's a way to stay in touch with my friends and the people I love. And what, the guy I have on today is a guy that I love very much. You know, we met uh, back when I was an A&R guy at Columbia Records. And I, was, I, I signed a band called Midtown from New Jersey, who I, I just loved and gave support. The singer was just an amazing guy. I really believed in him and them. And when the band broke up, they started working on a project with my, my guest today. And um, in uh, the Crush Management offices in New York City, which is a... Uh, a major, I mean, those guys are also my friends. Are, they're a management company that manages like, you know, Green Day and Panic! at the Disco and a bunch of other people. Sam and I met and we bonded over Sly and the Family Stone. And that was like the thing. We talked about that and Stevie Wonder. And, uh, and you know, I'll never forget it. So my guest is an award-winning songwriter, producer, and an incredible human being that I love very much. Sam Halder. Sam, what's up, man? How are you? Hey, 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 what's up, my brother? How are you, man? Oh, you know, I'm good, man. I'm hanging in there. You know, like for guys like me, isolation is a really difficult issue. Yeah. Um, you just have to fight through it, man. You know, like because I love to be out at seeing shows. I, you know, I, I just love to be in, in major contact with people. So it's super important. And it is music and I love for my family and friends that is getting me through these times, you know? Um, it's hard. I feel like, uh, you know, the Groundhog Day aspect of this is is like nothing I've ever experienced. I mean, every morning, the Sonny and Cher wake up is very trippy. And, um, you know, uh, same thing. I mean, I, you know, I, I, my family and my friends and, and obviously and music and, but, you know, the fresh air when it doesn't rain here, it does. Uh, it, 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 every day, every day is a little lighter. And I know we're cut, we will hit the end of the tunnel as as uh as they keep saying, but it's uh, being in it right now, man. This is so trippy. I, I really feel like I'm tripping my face off. It's very yeah, kooky. Like it's Diamond yeah. Dogs, Bowie's album, like that yeah. Doom and 1984 and cyberpunk, William Gibson, Philip K. Dick. It's, like, yeah. it's all of it in a bowl of gumbo. And the reality is, man, I'm like, yeah. at the end of the day, I, you know, I've turned the TV off. I won't watch anything that... Um, you know, that, that just, yeah. That, yeah, just everybody's got, you know, man, like, you know, everybody, I think that the media is run, you know, it's just everybody's on steroids with sort of fear right now. And unfortunately, we selling fe that. fear is a problem, you know? Yeah, you know, and fear is, um, fear is the, you know, the opposite of faith, you know, and That's we have right. to literally work through this entire thing and keep ourselves together for, for those we love. You know, speaking of which, Sam, last time I saw you in person, we were with Adam Schlesinger and you'd invited me to a showcase. You know, I always loved Adam. We, we would hang out at WXOU radio, that bar, you know, uh, with my, my ex-wife vet, um, you know, when she was my girlfriend and I'd meet him and Chris over there and we play the jukebox and, you know, and, and what an incredible guy. And, and literally it was just a beautiful moment when the three of us were together again, and they were hanging out. So, I, I mean, I know how close you were to him, man. I mean, how are you doing with that? Well, you know, it, um, uh, you know, I, I've lost a lot of people in my life through the years and, um, sometimes you, 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 you numb to it. This one hit me like very few things have ever hit me in terms of, um, you know, this was, uh, this was a beautiful, uh, a beautiful cat, man. This, this guy was, um, I don't know. He was, uh, you know, I've read all the accolades and I've read, you know, it's amazing because, you know, uh, yeah. every day if I read a tweet and, you know, there's a tweet from a celebrity or something about him, I hear his voice in my ear saying, yeah. 
that guy didn't like me. That guy never called me again. You know, I yeah. missed the snark, man. It's like this was like, <laughs> this guy. Oh, this guy was, yeah, man. He was like so. He was just whip smart and funny oh, and yeah. loyal and decent and just like, yeah. you no, know, man. He was a magnet. He was a guy you wanted to hang with. And you know, we both. Um, I guess we both sort of identified something uh, in each of us that we were drawn to many, many years ago. And we, we just began this friendship. And, you know, what I loved about Adam is I got pulled into Adam's world and um, it was full of all this cast of characters that, you know, his friends from birth all the way to sort of, you know, new friends he'd made along the way. And, you know, I made, I, I made so many peripheral uh, relationships through it where I just, I, you know, I connected with people who I just, everyone was interesting. You know what I mean? Like you always, every night was sort of an adventure with Adam where you just suddenly you're seated with like four people you've never met and they're all doing really neat things. And, you know, it was, uh, it was really a beautiful, a really, uh, both a beautiful friendship for me and one of the most special friendships I've ever had, but also it's just, um, it set a bar for me in terms of how you, uh, how you proceed in life in terms of I, I I'm, I'm inclusive, you know what I mean? I like people and I like that energy of people, you know, coming in, coming into my orbit. I, I, I find that really exciting and it keeps life interesting. And I, I learned a lot about that from Adam. He was, man, honestly, he, uh, everything I've read, uh, you know, it does him justice. He's a, he was like a truly an A plus guy. And I don't know, I it just, I, you know, I can't believe it at the beginning of this, you know, Cuomo, governor Cuomo said, um, you know, you're all going to know somebody, who uh, is really affected by this. And it's not that I rolled my eyes, but I thought to myself, oh, come on, I'm not, you know, no no one in my inner circle would get hit. And of course, that's what happens. And it's the, it, you know, sometimes it is an equalizer and uh, it's been a, a, a brutal, um, brutal week and a half. And honestly, it was really a brutal three weeks because, you know, it just was a, a, a just an arduous process of trying to get details and just, you know, his girlfriend, Alexis, was amazing, keeping us all in the loop of what was going on. But, you know, it's tough, man. Every day is a little trickier. So, we're, we, you know, we, we, we got to keep going. It's a true test of, uh, you know, like literally the resolve and, you know, and the will to keep carrying on, man, you know. And he was a, a man. I loved him. He was, he was a great guy. You know, was, and thank you for your getting us back together at that period of time. And that was a, a great night, man, you know? And I got I just, to talk to your studio, which was great, you know? So yeah. Was, yeah, man. I mean, look, and that's what that, but that's the spirit of Adam, right? It's just yeah. like reunite people, connect people. I mean, the, the, you know, our karaoke nights have become just these incredible free-for-alls of just Can't strange. Wait, do, it, do it again. Man. I mean, I, I literally, are you, I mean, I feeling like I just can't wait so I can give you a, fucking hug and hang out uh, with my friend. I know. I, and I have flashbacks yeah. of all these great moments. I was thinking about this morning and I was thinking about the night in New York and Adam texted me and I was going through a lot of hard stuff and he texted me, he said, you need to get down and meet me right now. We're going to have drinks with Peter Wolf. And I thought, all right, let's go. You know, and I went down there. We sat with Peter Wolf for an hour. We had this really trippy conversation with Peter Wolf that I can barely remember. But uh, it ended where we brought him behind the, the curtain that said Golds, and he came up and sang Centerfold. And 95% oh, of the people in the room had no idea who he was. So they thought yeah. it was just some old crazy man singing Centerfold by Jay Giles. <laughs> but it was Peter Wolf slaying it. And I'm not joking. So the night takes on this crazy turn where, you know, people keep showing up. And, you know, it's just a random Monday. And then Bill Murray walks through the door. And it just, you know, gets up there. And it was just like, it was perfect. It was like every day with Adam was sort of, it was Fellini-esque with like really. It's a just, you know? Like, yeah, a hundred percent. So, you know, I, I, I really, um, I'm going to miss him. So yeah. Yeah, trippy. Yeah, we will. And, you know, it's, um, you know, Hal Wilner was working on that T-Rex tribute album. We lost Hal, you know. You know, I didn't know Hal personally, but once again, you know, you just read the, you, you know, you re, you read the tributes and they're stunning. And the people, you know, a lot of people who are very close to me um, said he was one of the sweetest guys alive. I knew Neil Asher pretty well. Neil Asher was a great yeah, he, guy. He was my sponsor, you know, for yeah, a long time. Great, great guy, did amazing yeah. things for people. And, you know, he was on my yeah. publisher for years. And, you know, it's just... This whole thing's been just, it's its so nutty because you just keep wondering, well, what she's going to fall next. But, you know, think but positive and, you know, absolutely that's what we do. Man. And, you know, you're, you're a dad, right? So I am. How, you know, dealing with, 
I, I feel for all the parents out there right now. <laughs> you better. My daughters, my daughters, believe me, I miss my, my daughters so much. One's in Brooklyn yeah. and one is in Florida. They're and of I'm, age. They're of age, one, man. You know, they're, 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 they're free agents, you know. And they're, and they're, and they're really strong young women. So right. they're, they're fighting through this. And I right. love that they have that. But, it's, but as, a, as a parent of, some, of, of a young child, how's that? Like, it's... I got to tell you, you know, the early in the process, you know, I think, um, I, you know, I did a lot of reading and they said, you know, um, keep everything focused and keep them on a, some semblance of a schedule and don't let it devolve into anarchy. So, of course, I chose anarchy. And uh, so I thought, well, you know, I have to make it through. Initially, I was like, yeah, a month and a half. So what could I do? So I introduced her to Dawson's Creek because there are 126 episodes. So you <laughs> parcel those out over time right. and right. buys yeah. a little bit of time. But, you know, what's funny about it. Uh, you know, what's interesting about this is, you know, my kid being home and sort of binging things and doing these strange projects. Um, in some way, I'm seeing a light turned on in her that I haven't seen in a couple of years in terms of, you know, there's like interests that are really beginning to manifest. And I think it, part of it is the, the, there's just so much downtime and boredom that they're forced into creative situations. They can't just vegetate. At some point you actually have to think creatively. And um, I, I, I've been, honestly, I'm in awe of all the cool things she's like really talking about things that are beginning to interest her. It's been, it's been, uh, it's been the one sort of, um, you know, olive branch at the end of this, you know? Yeah, you know, it's funny you mentioned that Dawson's Creek because I was talking about the Joe Strummer documentary, The Future is Unwritten mm -hmm. with somebody yesterday. And I said, I remember when I went to see it on a rainy afternoon in New York City at the IFC Theater, speaking of Dawson's Creek, the only two people in the theater were me and Michelle Williams. The only two people Amazing. watching it. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. I was, so I was gonna say, I was going to say, I don't, have a, I don't have a lot of Dawson's for you. I mean, I did a lemonade stand with Busy but, uh, Phillips. That was big. I did some lemonade with Busy Phillips in the hood here. But yeah. the one thing I would say is, you know, I'd moved to L.A. and it's probably like 2012 or 13. And I'm, I walk into Soho House one night for dinner and Dawson's sitting in the corner, James Vanderbeek, and he's like working on a script in the corner. And I was like, wow, I really am in L.A. This is trippy. Like we've just broken every kind of strange fourth wall thing here. This is yeah. nutty. You know, I'm, I, I'm glad we live here, though. I mean, I, I like I said, I mean, the weather's been odd this week, but, you know, I still love it. And I want to talk to you, Sam, about, and I know, I, mean, I want to explain to people, like, how you got started in your love of music, writing, and producing. I want you to tell everybody about that. Well, you know, I just think I was sort of... Um... You know, my friend, uh, I have a friend, an MC named Toothpick, who I've always been a fan of. And, you know, he had a, he had a line in a song that we, we wrote together way back in the day. And he said, um, he said, uh, last man off the bench about to be captain of the team. And I've always sort of viewed myself as that person in music. I don't I really wasn't a first round choice. <laughs> and uh, so I clawed through it. And, you know, I came into this as the sort of the consummate fan and collector which is um, a different a different take. No one really needed to see me on a stage, but I was a guy who really grew up, you know, with that same sort of nerdy sort of, you know, fandom that I know you appreciate and McGrath appreciates and Lindsey Parker. There's like a lot of us out there who are just like, yeah. you know, the mega nerds of music, JD, you know, like we all, we, we all, we love them all, right? We yeah. Love, you know, yeah. Cause we, it's a, it's a tribe and, you know, yeah. and, and when you meet one, you suddenly sort of indoctrinate them into your thing, you know, John Hughes at Rhino. I don't know if you know John, but God, man. Yeah. What a great guy he is too. Yeah. You know, and it, we're, I mean, we just, we live and breathe it, you know? And, yeah. Uh, and that's right. And so I was one of those guys, but the, you know, I just, I, I wanted to emulate it, but I also, because I was, um, I was a collector uh, and it, my collections were so very, you know, varied. And, you know, we talk about, you know, nothing was genre specific. I was like a rock kid and a punk kid and a disco kid and a hip hop kid and all those things in a pot and like a new wave kid and all those things that made downtown New York sort of what it was is, you know, I grew up because I had an older brother who got me into it and, um, you know, and really exposed my record collection very young. I was, I was really dialing into so many different genres. And what happened was uh, I began to view music as this weird cornucopia where I could pull from these different parts and create songs that I felt 
sort of we're almost like uh, genreless, you know. And that's how I've always seen music. I never really understood the you know the categorization of it. I always felt like I could pull like the the wordplay of something that was rhythmic and hip hop versus something that was sort of punk and sort of dark and. You know, I tried to combine these things and that's how I've always looked at writing is it was just always going to be this bowl of soup. And that's how I found my place, because I think my influences were just wide enough that it, it gave me my own voice that, you know, began to raise its hand. Yeah, which is amazing. You know, and I, and I love that. But you're also like what I've always appreciated is you're like I feel like you and I are underdog. We're underdog guys in, in the, you know, in the beginning of everything. And uh, yeah, I mean, we still, I relate. Well, we still but like we hold on, but at the same time, hold on to that hard work ethic. We, I mean, like, and I also you know, remember okay. that I say that one of the things that I thought was just so, I loved so much about you when we, you know, after we met and we talked yep. about 70s soul, like we were yep. getting like, we were, going, we were going deep. And, uh, you know, our love for Sly and Stevie and, you know, like Tyrone Davis. I mean, I mean we were just, going, you know what I mean? And uh, main ingredient, it could have been anything, sure. you know, but. But, the, but I love that I, one of the things that I felt was just so amazing about you was I saw somebody wanted um, to work with you. There was like, um, and, I, you know, I'm not going to mention who it was, or, but it was right. somebody trying to put you together with like somebody who was like corporately in some, you know, like, yeah, thing. I mean, yeah. you know what? Well, I, and, you know, there's nothing wrong with corporations. I'm just saying sure. like, but it was this artist and like, the next time I saw you, I asked you, I go, how'd that thing go a couple of days ago? I go, and you said to me, he goes, I just couldn't feel any realness in it. So I had to let it go. And that was amazing to me. Yeah, because just... we like so many things that when you work with somebody and you can't find your realness, that's like, you know, that's saying a lot. I mean, I'm quick to shut it down, but I, you know, I don't do that. Um, I do that to spare everybody, uh, you know, Look, the the way songwriting is set up, you know, I, I look, I write with artists, you know, I've never really written pitch stuff successfully. So that was never my lane. My lane was collaborating with artists, which was perfect for me because I was like this consummate fanboy who couldn't believe I was in the room with these people. And oh, like, oh, hey, man, that's my, it, uh, both of us, right? But yeah, our man, like, oh my God, like I'm with Carol King or I'm with Paul Williams or Ringo or one of these cats. And I'm like, you know, it's crazy, you know? But so because I nerd out on that level, I have to, um, with everybody, I have to believe in the artistry um, to, a, you know, I, I just have to, there has to be something that I can stick my teeth into that makes me believe that I would kill for this and that I'm going to, I can channel it and I can summon it and the words and the melodies will come to me because I'm working with somebody who brings even more to the table. And so if I'm writing with something and it feels like contrived or calculated, and this is no knock on anything pop or anything like that, because there are brilliant pop artists I've collaborated with who are absolutely artists at a, a freakish level. Exactly. You know, exactly. nothing is genre specific, but if something feels like it is driven, um, it isn't driven from like a soulful place and I don't, I don't buy it, I, I end the session immediately. Um, because th they're going to go on the next day and write with somebody who, who, who finds some, some merit in it that I don't. So why would I waste anybody's time? I feel like it, it's much cooler to just step away from something. If we don't immediately, if I don't feel like the, that our, our hearts are aligned musically, there's no point in going further. And I would hope they would do the same with me. You know, it's worth I mean, shutting it down. You don't want to waste people's time. Life's too short. And I respect people's time. You know what I mean? I respect yeah, people's time because honestly, <laughs> we're all yeah but look we're all in this like man we're all fighting for our, our um survival and our musical <laughs> our musical identities and i would do anything to like you know i, I want to see everybody win and that by the way is a schlesinger um philosophy man you know it's like yeah. i want to see people win i believe in people and i want people to win but i want people to win doing the right thing and putting yeah. it, you know, if it's believable and it's, and it's written for the right reasons, man, I, I, I'm a cheerleader every time out. You know, and that's the thing I always said, you know, and uh, back in the day uh, with 120 minutes, once in a while critics would say, well, he seems to like everything, which is was absolutely true. But at the same time, I respect and love musicians. And, and the fact that right. whatever somebody does, to put the blood on the tracks and they spent six months or whatever it took to make that record. I will give, I wanted to give them the respect and relate that 
so that people that would find them might make that connection, you know? Remember, so, it, it, in my heart, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm adding an ingredient from the, from the beginning of the recipe, right? We're building up a cake and I'm in the ground floor of the cake. But the reality is the artist then goes out and they're touring these things for a year and a half. And they're waking up at four in the morning every day to do, you know, um, local talk shows and, and, you know, and national stuff. And, you know, they work so hard. And if, you, you know, I think that, that if you're not really, you know, in the mix, sometimes you're not aware of how hard it is. You know, these people, their lives are completely uprooted to promote something. So the fact that these guys, you know, whoever I collaborate with, the work that they put into it is tenfold over what I'm doing. So I come from a place of respect. And yeah. all I'm trying to do is, as a fan, come in the room and hopefully, like, just approach the movie. It's a, you know, it's a note I learned from Nile Rogers. Nile Rogers said to me when I was about 27, 28, we were writing a song for Donna Summer. And Nile said to me, look, man, you know, I, I had hit a wall and I, I just, I, I was apprehensive because I, you know, when you say Nile Rogers and, and, um, and Donna Summer, if you add Barry Gibbon to that, that's like the trifecta of greatness of, of my youth, you know, of a certain yeah, thing. Right. It's incredible. And, and I said, yeah. to him, look, man, I, I, I'm not intimidated. I, I don't, I'm, I'm hard to, I'm a, I'm a tough kid. I'm hard to, I'm hard to ruffle, but I want to, how would, how would I approach this? Cause I don't want to overstep and I want to be respectful. And you two are really the greatest. And he said to me right then and there, man, you come into it, treat it like you're a director and you're making like the, the, the sequel to the, the, the movie and what's the sequel and, and just speak openly about it and have no fear and just, you know, just, just speak it and, 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 and just let your sort of presence be felt. Do not, be a wallflower. Do not sit back and be passive. Like step up and and go for the jugular with your idea. Because even if you put it out there and it whiffs, at least like it comes from a really organic place. So that's what I did, and that's when I began to understand how to approach artists. Because I think you know your first instinct is to go in with kid gloves on, but I take a different approach, which is I go on. You know, I've done so much due diligence, and I've done yeah. so. I put so much thought into. Um, you know, of what I would want from somebody, man, you know, what, what yeah, I would want to hear. Yourself, you see yourself in their position, which I love, but as a fan and music fan, you look at, you look at a song that you're working on and they were like, how can I make this better? What can we do with this thing? You know, speaking yeah. of Niall, you know, Niall and Carlos Alomar co-wrote Fame with Bowie and Lennon. Yeah. Those guys, when I was elected to the Board of Governors and the Grammys in New York, and you were on it as well, you know, like we were up at some point, right? Yeah. Um, I love just to hear their stories, man. Like, it was just like I would talk. I wanted to hear every, yeah, you know, on every like, a, James Brown record and Edwin Starr. And, you know, it was just great. You know, this, you know for me, the I think the what keeps me waking up in the morning is the reality that I get to work with, like, little kids with funny haircuts who have fire and a punk rock sensibility and want to just take on the world and just, like, and just, like, just, and just steamroll. And then I get to work with sort of icons and legends of different eras who yeah, like Ringo have, Starr, Billy Idol recently, like um, you know, uh, you Carol King we talked about. Phil Collin, <laughs> Def Leppard, the OJs, man. I mean, dude, it, dude, it's the OJs, right? I mean, yeah, like, I mean, you look, love that. The fact, that, the the thing that, like, you know, creatively, what what gets me up in the morning, like, if I have one of those days with one of these cats, and I really bring it, and they send me a note afterwards that just like that they were psyched and that they were impressed, you know, man, that's what, that's four years of education for me. It's like, I'm trying to learn from the best and that's why I want to be the, I want to, I, I want to make music that actually mattered and resonated, but I also want to work with people who teach me constantly. So I just keep learning because it, uh, it, it, it evolves. I, I try to stay up on everything that's happening now of the second. So I'll listen to things that work on TikTok because I'm trying to understand what kids listen to and why they listen to it. And at the same time, I, you know, I want to work with the greats and learn the narratives and learn about, you know, uh, you know, Ringo and Harry Nielsen and, um, yeah. you know, uh, and, uh, Keith Moon me. driving down from the mansion. On Let me just say, hey, yeah. really wish I had met Keith Moon. Oh. Glad I'm, I know Ringo and Harry Nelson's son, but man, Hal Wilner, who he just lost, like I said, he had amazing Harry Nelson stories too, you know? Anyway, I want to just say, I'm so proud of you, Sam. Like, Thanks, buddy. I mean, I know it's been an incredible year this past year for you, you know, winning the awards for High Hopes, Panic at the Disco. You've written songs for so many people, with so many people. 
and for so many people with fits in the tantrums. I mean, the list can go on and on. But right now we're going to talk about seven of your favorite albums. Fun. Because the thing that we <laughs> met about, is not, one of them is on this list. But I'm going to start with the band from the place that I was born, Athens, Georgia, R.E.M. Life's Rich Pageant. Let's yeah. talk about that. You know, I, um, as a kid, I, I, I made the nat natural progressions, right? They were logical progressions. I went disco. I went into classic rock after disco because of my age, because I was a little too young to get it the first time. But I did, uh, I, I went, uh, truly, I went Bee Gees into The Who, The Who into rem these were the three bit the, the you know when i'm talking about like the the the, the yeah. band that you know and rem was my first real favorite band and it began with um it began with murmur and chronic town you know and it, it uh as we went into reckoning i saw them live on on that tour and that was the first time i saw them and then fables and i love fables because I really love the horn play, uh, you know, on uh, I Can't Get There From There, and I love Driver 8 and blah, blah, blah. But then they dropped Life's Rich Pageant, man. And Life's Rich Pageant for me, it's Don Geeman, right? So Don Geeman made that record. And what I, yeah. the thing about that record was, you know, as a kid, I just remember there was, it was so punky in its spirit, and yet so brilliantly melodic. And it's when I began to understand the, the genius of Mike Mills' counter melodies against Stipe. And just, you know, I, I have a memory. I can, uh, you know, I can, I can suddenly close my eyes and I'm at, um, I'm at uh, Felt Forum and I'm seeing them on that tour. And um, they, uh, they close, I believe, with Superman and they brought, uh, oh, what was this cat's name? The dude, oh, the guy from The Click, they brought out, I. Uh, uh, yeah, Gary, Gary Zeckley. They brought up Gary Zeckley on stage who had written the song and wow. he, he wrote sooner or later for the grassroots. Right. And, uh, yeah, you know, and I knew his daughter very well. And, uh, yeah, man, you know, she, yeah, she lost him. It, it, it was a kind of a weird thing. Like I, I don't want, I don't want to bring the mood down, but I think, I think he murdered or something really weird happened, but he was a great songwriter. It's a great songwriter. And his sweetheart and her and i would talk a lot that's anyway, crazy i didn't know that yeah so and they, they brought him out to sing superman in the encore with him but that whole record it starts out at the beginning with begin to begin you know it, I, I believe uh, even like but, and follow me is just follow one me of is perfect great. i you know, love follow like, me follow me but my favorite song on that record is actually hyena because hyena you know i tend to like records that start to push those tempos of like 150 160 bpm where like the pulse rate is just yeah. getting psychotic you know and yeah. i used to just scream hyena i used to, i remember just like playing air guitar to that song thinking man this is just the coolest thing ever uh, uh that record just i don't know that was so transformative for me and you know and i was a snotty little kid right so i was a little punk kid so that you know it's right around the time is that the last irs record that's the last one before they jumped to Warner uh, Brothers, is that right? I, I, um, no document was the last IRS. Record, document, right? okay. So, so do, yeah. So, and then of course, I, so it's funny because I know Scott Litt pretty well, and I, I love Scott Litt. He's a really good guy. But you know, when we sit at dinners, I'm always thinking, man, you know, you're late era, man. You 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 know, I like the Geeman, you know, the yeah. Don Dixon stuff. Like it, Don, it, Don Dixon, yeah. Don Dixon yeah. was like, yeah, he's a great producer, right? Those guys were and, just and so those, cool, man. Those guys like the dudes from Let's Active and yep. you know Mitch, um, Mitch Easter, man. Mitch Easter. Mitch Easter was man, that guy was great too, yep. you know. And I think I he might be a Facebook guys. friend of mine, but I don't know if it's a real Facebook friend. Like it's one of these things where oh, I yeah. swear there's you ever those Facebook friends. Here's the funniest. I'm gonna make I'm gonna say this very quickly. Go. Because I, I want to get all your records. I want to talk about <laughs> this guy was like trying to say to me that he was Dean DeLeo and when, from Stone Temple Pilots. Who doesn't realize that I've known Dean, you know, like, you know, forever. And then he drove up in a delivery truck when he was still working. But Core was recorded and he brought it to me in that little house in New Jersey in Asbury Park to play wow. on the radio. And, wow. and so he goes... Yeah, man, thank you for supporting us. I'm like, really? If you're Dean, tell me what happened in your house that night in California with the garage door and the T-Rex thing. And <laughs> totally full of shit. You know, just, yes. just uh, I don't know. I never I, know I guess, who's real. Yeah, it's all yeah, like, yeah, it's, it's all can't trust shit. these crazy kids. 
Yeah, right. But but anyway, you know, um, when we go to the next record, which is just such a great one, Tribe Called Quest. Let's talk yeah. about it. This is this is my you know it's funny because today is the 30th anniversary of this record. It's the 30th anniversary. What is today? today is it's the 30th yeah, anniversary of uh, People's Instinctive Travels, and it's also Q Tip's birthday. And you know this is my favorite album I've ever owned. This is my number one favorite album. And the reason I say that is, you know, I was um, I was 17 when De La Soul came out, and you know I thought that was just. When I heard De La Soul, I thought, okay, this is, this is... I mean, it was fucking amazing. Yeah, when they started dropping those singles and they dropped Jennifer, she taught me, and they dropped uh, Me, Myself, and I back to back. Someone I know. Pot, potholes in my lawn, potholes in my lawn. And yeah. that when I heard, like, Say No Go, and they had a Hall and Oates sample, and they had the Turtle samples, and they had all this... And, you and, know, and all... Stu Dan, who we were talking about when we before yep. we got on here, because I, I posted, I love any major dude. We were talking yep. about that. Yeah, and they had Steely Dan samples, exactly. I mean, all of it, and, 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 and P-Funk and everything else, and it was all... The way they did it was it was the first time I'd ever I didn't even know these guys, but I felt like they had a window into my soul because my soul was this weird mix of stuff and genres and cross genre bending and stuff. And they were all doing it and they were doing it sampling. Prince Paul was doing it. And, um, you know, Q-Tip featured on the record and he featured on the Jungle Brothers record. And then they dropped the Tribe Called Quest. They first, they, they dropped Benita Applebaum. They, they actually, I think they dropped Pubic Enemy maybe first. And then, yeah. and, um, by and then uh, go, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. And then go, yeah, exactly. It's amazing. And and then go ahead in the rain. that record all the, like clubs all the time. Oh, it's the greatest. Oh. But Tribe Called Quest, man, when that album came out, I stood on a tower. I bought it that night and I went home and I put it on. And that stayed on. That shit literally stayed on till six in the morning. And I played it over and over and over again. And obviously, this is pre-internet. And there's samples on that record that I just didn't know. I didn't know the Billy Brooks samples. And, I, you know, there were so many things on there that I had never heard. And my head is just spinning. And, and, and Q-Tip's narratives are so crazy. I left my wallet in El Segundo and After Hours and Footprints and oh, Lucky yeah. Lucienne. And I remember, you know, my, 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 my good buddy, Jake Miller, um, who uh, passed many years ago, who's one of my uh, favorite people I ever knew. Um, Jake was, uh, we, were, uh, we were walking through Washington Square Park and he had met Lucienne from Luck of Lucienne. And yeah. I remember the, oh, like we were both starstruck. We're like, man, this guy knows the track on Quest, man. He's Lucienne, the real Lucienne. And we were like all nervous around a guy who got name checked in a song, you know? And uh, for me, that record, everything about that record says, you know, New York, 18 years old, chasing a dream. And, you know, my, my buddy Tyler Rowe posted something today. He remembered the moment when we were, I guess, 18 or 19, we were walking uh, past Phoebe's Bar, right? Or by the Bowery Bar, you know? Yeah, yeah, and exactly, yeah. And Q-Tip's riding in a town car, and he's sitting in the front seat with the driver, and we're both gawking at him. And he just waves at me, gives me a peace sign. And it was one of those moments I thought, man, I'm going to see this guy again. And then fast forward years down the line, Ron Perry connects me to write with Q-Tip. He said, you're a big Tribe fan. You want to write with Q-Tip? I said, fuck yeah. Pairs me with this guy. We wrote together. And then I get a text from, um, I get a text from his assistant. And she's like, hey, she said, like, Q-Tip wants, uh, wants you to come. He's spinning at the Ace Hotel in the basement tonight. You should come over. And I showed up with my buddy Travis Clark from the band We the Kings. And we showed up and we get ushered over to a special section like that's roped off. And I'm thinking, all right, this, this is kind of weird. And out of nowhere, Q-Tip walks over with a tray of shots for us. And me and Q-Tip and Travis Clark from We the Kings are doing shots. And I'm like, what is my life, man? This is the craziest thing ever. And that's when I really began to think anything is possible, man. I'm permeating. I'm beginning to like do stuff that that's going to resonate, you know? Yeah, and it's brilliant, man. You know what I mean? Like, I love that. I just want to tell you, like, you know, having those 12 inches of I left my wallet, El Segundo, I actually can't think of El Segundo without that song. Like, it's just yeah. forever because we're East Coast guys. Like, even when I drive by it, I'm hearing the Tribe Called Quest song. And what is yeah. that? That sample? That's a Rascal sample, right? Yeah. That's and the a Rascal, Rascal sample. Right yeah. We love yeah. Long Island. Yep. We love yep. it. Long Island and rock, man. It's good. Yeah, man. And, you know, also, you know, we think about like Lou Reed and 
using that incredible baseline on can I kick it is just, you know, you can't help. It's the most incredible thing ever. And then there was a, it was, I want to say a cut father and soul shock or one of those cats did the remix on that, which I believe use a, maybe a Coltrane horn equally as fresh. I mean, Coltrane horn was incredible. Yeah. 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 The sophistication on this stuff was just, it was just so beyond me and it gave me something aspirational because, you know, I just, look, I, I wanted to write songs, man. At the end of the day, I really wanted, I thought I was born in the wrong time. I thought I was a Brill building writer. But, man, this exposed me to this whole other world. And uh, then I was just completely hooked. You know, it's funny. I I have a story about smoking a joint with Neil Diamond and the guy from Leon. That's pretty amazing. But it's just funny. In, in Dublin, Ireland, me, Nathan, Caleb, and fucking Neil Diamond, and Neil's assistant, Susan, came up to me, like, and she's standing there, she goes, hey, um, Matt, Neil would like to see you outside on the, on the patio. <laughs> I go out there. And the first thing I say is, Neil, they finally released the bang years, all your early shit. Man, I've, I've been looking for that B-side of, girl, you'll be a woman soon. You'll forget awesome. forever. Awesome. <laughs> and it was awesome. like, and he was telling me about bro building and all the songwriting things. He's like, yeah, I go downstairs. We'd hand the mob guys the checks and they'd give us cash and take their share because yep. Yep. they didn't dare like fuck with yep. those guys. You know, what I mean? like, just, it was a, it was a very, you know, it was a very different game. Now they, that, you know, now instead of that, you do Pilates and yoga after the session to decompress, you know, yeah, the, world, exactly. the world has changed. Now, Stevie wonder you and I have always loved so much. And this next record is the time when, Robert uh, Margoloff, who I became friends with out here, and really, he gave, yeah, wow. and I, he gave me a ride home from from my friend Jeff's house one night. That's incredible. And we talked about all the synth treatments he did on that incredible run of Stevie Wonder albums, and the Isley Brothers, who's that that lady, part one and two, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and he's what a lovely dude he is, man. You know, and he's just like. That guy's like so revolutionary, right? All those Stevie records. I mean, you know, I've always had, there have been so many moments when I thought about putting Stevie Wonder's head, the album cover, getting that tattoo on my arm, because that record emotionally hits every but single sweet one, spot for me. Mind, music of my mind. Music of my mind. Music of my mind. Music of my mind. Beginning and, of, it was the beginning of the incredible run. Yep. Was that talking book? And he just, which is my favorite, and then fulfilling his first finale, like that stuff was just incredible, right? I mean, well, I you know, he's playing the instrument. Yeah, he's playing the instruments. He's experimenting with moogs and arps, and he's like, you know, the sophistication of his insane. But the writing, I mean, to me, the whole record comes down to Superwoman. You know, ah, oh, Superwoman is is so great, man. And and it's, well, yeah, the melodies and and the things he's sort of pulling from, you know, and there's a lot of jazz and I hear like some Brazilian stuff, but emotionally I don't know if there's a more gut-wrenching record for me in terms of music of my mind. I just, you know, it's full of all this potential of relationships and then it just devolves as it goes and yeah. you hear his his um you know, his unrequited sort of thing, just rearing its head. I thought, I mean, the reality that this guy had that run, like you said, in a row, those albums in a row, uh, I, there's no artist. I mean, uh, to me, it's up there. The Beatles and Stevie sit on the strange pedestal yeah. of like the greatest short-term runs I ever saw. Maybe Prince, you know? You know, yeah. Oh, Prince, of course we love. Yeah, yeah. you know, I have a story. We're going we're gonna to talk about Jamiroquai in a minute, but I'm going to just say this very quickly. Related to Stevie, one of my favorite memories is sitting on the floor at RFK Stadium in the hallway with Jermiroquai. He and I singing Golden Lady and oh doing God. like, oh he and God. I are sitting there. Wow. And with the biggest smiles on our face. It was the coolest fucking thing ever. It was so much fun. We're moving on to the band that actually really kind of united you and I. That we love so much. Sly and the Family Stone. There's a riot going on. What an incredible record, man. I mean, what, they're one of my favorite bands of all time. So let's talk about it. I mean, you know, this is that rare moment where whatever drugs this dude was taking worked. Yeah. You know, he, 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 he had, most <laughs> yeah, it's just like, you know, the that record to me is so punk rock sonically. 
It is so explosive. The fact is you could put that record on today and it stands up against anything on the radio. It's the choice of the drum machines are so sophisticated. And, you know, Sly, I mean, just just the guests on it, everything about it, like it, it just, I, I've i never really heard a record like it, you know, and he's Can cutting it. away. Uh, by the really way, I wore this for you. I wore this for you. I'm wearing my Sausalito shirt because, you know, it's kind of, a summer night. Well, he could, yes, because <laughs> he cut the record at the record plant in Sausalito, yeah. you know, and yeah, right. he's lying on his bed cutting these vocals and he's working the rhythm king for the drum machine. Yeah. And he has Billy Preston and he has Ike Turner. And he has guests, but he doesn't want anyone around. He, and the bulk of it, it's just the, the rhythms of the way how he blew out that drum machine. It is so primal and crazy. I've never heard music like it. But then you have Family Affair and you have Running Away and you have, you know, yeah. you know, You Caught Me Smiling, which is my favorite, which has the greatest little yeah. sort of horn melody. You Caught melody. Me Smiling, what's so cool, when you listen to that, there's something about the distortion, like when his voice goes up, that's, like you said, very primal. That record is just, even Running Away has this incredibly almost like weird sound and feel to it, but lyrically, uh, everything about it, with Rose singing that, oh. you know, funny, why is it, I used to have this thing where every, when I was ever working in Vegas, every casino I went to was playing Running Away, and I thought it was like, kind of, <laughs> like an inside joke, the deeper get out, you get, get uh, out the while harder you get, you, yeah. you need yeah. more room to play. Yeah. Like, That's oh, great. It just like, it wasn't wasted on it. You know what I mean? That's awesome. But I love, I love that record. You're right. It has so much. It's just so different sounding. For its Nothing time. sounds like it, you know, and I've heard people cop it and nobody can get it right in terms of it just I, I don't know how to explain the low end on that record, but it is so explosive. And then his vocals are so blown out on the top and it's yeah, almost like a sleigh, it's like a sleigh bells record on top yeah. of, you know, a, a little Rhythm King drum machine, but somewhere in the middle of it, it just, it, it will just de decimate any speaker system you have. And yet yeah. it feels <laughs> like rage to me. It feels like the rage and anger. It's like, it just, you can feel everything he's going through, his relationships, his relationships with the band, his relationships with the world, re relationships with the record label, everything. Yeah, I mean, everything that, right? yeah. I mean like, you feel that whole thing where, I think a lot of the black community thought that he should be much more militant at that right, time. Right. He had everybody pulling him in different directions. You and know, he's uh, a, and he was a hippie at the core, man. He's a hippie from the yeah, you know, and a great DJ. Like there's that. There, it's funny when you find those old audio tapes of him doing radio shows in San Francisco, man. It's oh, like, amazing, stuff amazing. Is so cool. Amazing. And you know, he produced the Bo Bromos. Like yeah, which is an amazing fact that yeah, that's deep cuts. Yeah, I totally, you know, that's amazing. It's true. You know, so yeah. it's like that. That stuff is so cool. So let's go move on to Jamiroquai, Return of the Space Cowboy, his second album. You know, the '90s for me, man. Here's the thing about the '90s, right? The '90s for me, the the front end of the '90s are sort of a hundred percent hip hop and a hundred percent golden era hip hop. A lot of you know back what what we would deem backpacker stuff, right? All the native tongue stuff. And all the ancillary stuff that sort of spun out of that. That's all I listened to all day long. And I spent my days at the flea markets and I tried to write it. And that's how I began to understand wordplay by studying these records, you know. And then, you know, Jamiroquai comes along. And I, I discovered Jamiroquai, I want to say, maybe in 92. And, um, uh, you know, P uh, Emergency on Planet Earth I loved. but And I really connected to it. And, uh, um I was I was I was immediately taken. You know, I read all the press on it. The UK press said, "Oh, he's a Stevie Wonder clone, Stevie Wonder clone." But I began to hear something else. But then I thought on Space Cowboy, it, you know, he put himself on another planet because the influences were so wide. It's soulful, but it's Brazilian, and it's all these other things. Like if you go to Stillness and Time, the melodies oh, in Stillness and Time. This is, yep, Dude, that's it. The it's, sophistication it's on that, right? and it's such an emotional lyric. Yeah. And, you know, this guy's like, at the end of the day, like, you know, uh, that band to me, I saw Jameer Coy on the next tour after that. And I would say um, Toby Smith, the late, great Toby Smith was playing, you know, the Whirly and the Rhodes. And that guy was writing the stuff. And the two of them, you know, JK and, and Toby. And, 
you go down that record, man. You go down like Light Years and, you know, yeah, like Mr. Years. Moon. I love Mr. Moon and yeah. Space Cowboy. Good. And once again, like music to me should be, you know, for if, if, a, if a song works for me, it means that I can like I can trans, trans, uh, transform to another place in time and space. And I can remember that one pivotal moment of listening to it where it impacted every thought in my brain. And I can close my eyes and I'm in, a, I'm in Fire Island. My brother and I shared a, a place in Fire Island for a couple of summers. And um, I'm sitting on a deck and the sun is setting and there's a cover band a really shitty cover band is playing <laughs> at the one bar at Davis Park, you know? A really shitty and, cover band. Like, that's the story of our lives. So yeah. Far. And, you know, but it's all heart. But I do wait, remember. Wait, wait. As long as, I mean, as long as, they, as long as they mean it, that's all that matters. They, you know, and they, they did they did a very tasty version of uh, Chairman of the Board. Give, give me just a little more time that I was like, because the guy yeah. kept doing that. Look, General Johnson, man. General that, Johnson. That was amazing. South Carolina rock, yeah, man. But you know, was, uh, was beach, beach music, beach man. Music. <laughs> yeah, beach right. music. But, hey, Piper. Yeah. You know, I um with with Jamiroquai, I remember that in between sets, because the 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 feedback from this band, you know, we lived, our place was, you know, 55 yards away from the one bar. So we had to sit through the set no matter what from our deck, but then it ended. And we had like a 45 minute respite where we could just breathe. And I put on Space Cowboy, that album. And the second the roads hits, I can get chills in my back. And I remember what the sky looked like that day. And once again, like, you know, I've never met JK. Uh, you know, I, I would say like. Oh, you guys get along so unbelievably. Yeah, there's oh, a 10 year run for that guy. Yeah. And there's a 10 year run for that guy where no one could touch him in my book. And, you know, we didn't discuss the cardigans as well, that first record life, but those two records were the records that really got me through the mid to late nineties. I just, Oh, those two acts, I listened to them over and over. And then obviously things like our boy McGrath and Sugar Ray and better than uh, Ezra Griffin and all this sort of stuff, you know, my boys, yeah. but like, I would say uh, there's nothing Jamiroquai to me is in this very special spot. Yeah, it was, it was absolutely so great. We got two more albums to talk about and then we're going to have to break, but, Okay. Sam, I I love Echo and the Bunnymen so much. And, you know, my friend Jim Philippan was, you know, with Golden Voice was putting on that uh, Crew World Festival with Morrissey, yep. Devo, um, all right, Bauhaus, Gary Newman, Echo and the Bunnymen. So I first, I was like, it's heaven for me. I mean, I'm like, Do you oh, remember oh. you posted it? Do you remember what I wrote? Yeah. Did you think it was a joke? I mean, yep, like, I said, is this real? Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. It was unbelievable. You know, sadly, I mean, obviously, you know, I mean, at every level, man, for all the musicians and all the people that are out there, it's, you know, we, you know, we, we got to support each other and, and find ways to get each other through these times. But I texted Mac, you know, Ian McCulloch wow. in England because I want to wow. see if his phone number was still the same. How about you? How about you? You're just like I texted Mac. I, I have like a friend named Mac. It's less interesting. Well, you know, Mad, he used to call me Mad Mad Mac, Mad Matt, because that's awesome. He, well, because we were just fucking out of control. Yeah. And, you know, and when he came to town, it actually got to the point at you know where I had to some days say, "Mac, I can't go out with you." <laughs> <laughs> out of control, I can't do it. But I love Echo and the Bunny Man so much, and I, I think it's really funny that Leslie Fram, who now is like one of the people that helps run CMT. She's lovely. Luffy, isn't she the best? Leslie yeah. is amazing. I love her. She's like a sister. Um, she likes to tell the story that when we were on the air, uh, she goes, yeah, I um, I heard you named Matt, Mad Matt, after Mad Max. She goes, no, I think they named Mad Max after Matt. <laughs> <laughs> we were, we were I can... you know, but I love those records so much. Like, you know, and Songs to Learn and Sing is such a great compilation. That single <laughs> It's, you know, it, the thing about Echo and the Bunnymen is as 80s sort of when the 80s nostalgia lived on, right, that, you know, there were certain bands that got pushed to the forefront. And I think certain bands began to, I wouldn't say get forgotten, but I mean, like the cure went to another stratosphere, right? You know, yeah. so my, my kid knows the cure intimately. And I think that stuff is incredible. I'm a huge cure guy. But Echo and the Bunny Man for me were the coolest of the cool. It was like, it was this weird post-punk thing and it was dreamy. It was like dreamy yeah. post-punk. And 
you know, I, uh, I look at the, that track listing and I can go down that thing and they hit a couple things incredibly, right? You have these incredible, yeah, like that's what I was going to say. Like you have these tempo records, like, you know, you have the cutter and do it clean. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) All that stuff is just like, and it's, and it's, and it's just, and it's just like this, this adrenaline shot and it's so brilliantly crafted and the guitars are just like on fire. And then they have the ballads and those ballads, they have Killing Moon and Bring oh, On The Dancing Horses yeah. and everything feels, it's John Hughes, man. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. it's it's everything I believed in in the 80s. It's, you know, like OMG. it's just like. OMG was, I mean, obviously another thing, but, but they were great. Yeah. Um, I love them, but I mean, yeah. very much. You know, I have an architecture and morality shirt I wore a couple of days ago, but for OMD and. OMD were incredible. But, you know, yeah, Mac is just, uh, Guy's got an incredible voice, and there's something about him and Will Sargent together in that band, you know, that just, um, man, I loved. And, you know, I, I would see those shows in New York City when I was younger, and it was very emotional. It, like, it really hit me. And, you know, them and Teardrop Explodes, even though he and Julian Cope, like, uh, you know, they, they're at odds. They've been at odds with each other forever. <laughs> I love them both. You know what I mean? And uh, I see. Yeah, I saw I, Echo. I saw uh, in high school, and I, I saw them, and I believe it was Echo and the and the Church. And oh, but there's another I love. But I pre, love. you know, but it, it was on the Tantalized tour, you know. But yeah. I have a moment of Echo. I think it's funny. I had a crew. There are a whole bunch of kids from high school. What I love about growing up is, you know, I try to explain this to my kid all the time. You do find your tribe, right? And yeah, you do. For me, the tribe were the kids who took the Metro North to the city to go see shows on Friday nights, you know? And I have visions of it, like going to a show with a couple of my friends and there were some older kids there, you know? I have a friend named Jason Tannenbaum and I remember this guy was there with, there were, but, and he was there with a bunch of girls who were a couple of grades above me. And, um, and, you know, we were all standing next to each other. And at one point, the entire crowd is lifted up in the air just from the, the surge. And we all get pushed 10 feet back and then 10 feet forward. I never experienced that, man. And I um, so sort of like the predecessor of, of moshing at popular shows, you know. But we just yeah. got absolutely lifted into the air. And I remember thinking, man, this is like... This is what I want to do with my life. I want to write these songs that that do that thing that sort of propel people to sort of uh, you know get in motion and just sort of drift and be sort of taken by them. Yeah, isn't that the, the beautiful thing? So like they're they're rushing me off, and it's kind of you know what I you know. It is I'd, r- it I'd is. rush me off too. I feel like I'm sort of like an hour and forty guy. What, what's up? I love you, man. We, you and I can talk for hours. But I, the last album you picked is a guy that, man, I became such good friends with Bob Mold and even Grant Hart. Like you know, we went through a lot of things. You know what I mean? We yeah. talked about a lot, and and Bob helped me through some tough times for me to see, you know how to like deal with some of some of the issues we have in our life. And I, and I love him so much. He was very kind to me and wrote nice things about me in his book. And I hosted that thing at the Walt Disney Music Hall. He and Dave Grohl flew me into uh Which is incredible. Do you know, you so know? do you know, I, I missed it. I was in New York. I watched it on cable and I came out of it thinking, God, Grohl, Grohl with Husker Du is the coolest thing Dude. I've ever heard. Day Rising, yep. it was like fucking yep. thunder yep. on stage. I, I had, I've always and respected goes- Grohl, you know, for obvious reasons, but my my appreciation of Grohl from watching that show went to another stratosphere. You know, I've never met Bob, right? I've never met Bob. Uh, man, I, I've seen him live a bunch. I, you would oh, love I mean, him. He's the one he of the is, nice things, man. man. He's one that. of my favorite writers ever, you know, he, he impacted my writing. You know, if, if I could say the two things that impacted my writing at 18 were Bob Mould and Q-Tip, right? Yeah. It was, it was the rhythms of one and the narratives of the other and, and sort of the, the unrequited stuff and the, the, you know, there, it's funny because I, I look at those Husker Du records and Grant Hart's an incredible writer, yeah. but like the Mould now, stuff. You know, yeah. You know, yeah, the, I mean, Grant has great songs too, you know, I mean, it's a Bob, different thing. It's a different thing. Yeah, Bob never stuff. You again and things yeah. like that, you know, 
I well, mean, I, you lonely, you know? in my cover band in high school, we sang Ice Cold Ice, you know? Ah. And I remember, like, you know, people who had to see me sing it live had to suffer through five minutes of me, you know, <laughs> to, to do it my best shot. But the heart was there. I mean, these important years, you know, I, uh, I that, you know, if you don't stop to smell the roses now, they might end up on you, man. I mean, I heard that stuff in high school and that was like yearbooks with their yearbooks with their autographs and friends you might have had. These are your important oh years. You better God, make them laugh yeah. and falling in and out of love. Just like, man, that's poetry. It, you know, and once I uh, when I began to, you know, mess around, um, finally working with uh, pop, pop, pop punk bands and emo bands and stuff like that, you know, I always uh, for inspiration just in my head, I would have to hear well, I would think to myself, would Bob Bob Mould write this? Would Bob Mould approve of this lyric? Does it speak? Is it yeah. believable? Does it have the heart? You know, because to me, he laid everything out there. And then this guy takes a, a sidebar and writes wrestling, right? Yeah, I mean, what Bob is just just this incredible guy. I I just want to say that the song I love so much on the album you picked, Warehouse Songs and Stories, mm -hmm. which at the time they came to Rutgers University and did the whole album. Wow. straight through and wow. I was, which is why, standing in the rain it's amazing dude. that's by the way that's and probably I, the best I, song on the record in the rain. <laughs> I was, you know I how about that lyric like that. isn't that the right. most e but isn't that really the most emo lyric ever yes. i should have guessed you'd stand me up why did i even go now and i guess it goes yes. to show yes. the sun may I mean, well yeah, fall out but it goes right down the emo. drain okay I mean, that, hey Bob and the Buzzcocks, right? Yep. Blue, blueprint for emo, right? Yep. You know? I could literally, I could do that song as spoken word. I mean, I know that one so intimately. That song just gutted me as a kid. And I was a kid, you know, who had many, many of the, who could relate to that lyric tenfold many nights of my life. So, uh, yeah. you know, that was one for me, man. Like, that's the best song on the record. And it's also like, yeah, that one just still cuts to the core. It's the best of angst and teen and just, you know... Uh, yeah. God. Hey Sam, I, I love you so much, brother. And I'm, you know, thanks for doing my show. I love you, buddy. Thank you for having me. And honestly, like, like, like you said, I mean, the about these times, I think it's so imperative that people think not, you know, it, it's not only about the musicians, but it's about the crew and 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 the tech and all the oh, people exactly. who work for all these bands. And that's what I, you know. Guys that you know set up the techs like yeah. every. Oh, there's so many people in this business and in every job that get impacted on so many levels. And, you know, I think about them. It's about, you know, that's that's yeah. where my heart is right now. Yeah, I love all those people. You know, they're the people that are a part of everything. that. It's we the fabric do. of why we do this. You know, you're right. You're is, right. I mean, music is everything. To us. I know. You know what I mean? I don't and have anything else. <laughs> so listen, man, Sam. All the best to you and your family. I love you, buddy. Love Thank you. you for having me, Thanks okay? For show, man. All in right. a Lonely Place is the name of the show. My tip of the hat to the Smithereens and Humphrey Bogart. And, and I just want, by the way, I just want to say, like, if there, if anything, and before they cut me off, I just want to say if I could go back in time, you know, I never met Pat Denizio. He ate at John's on 12th the way I ate at John's on 12th. And a couple yeah. of times he sat at tables across from me, and I uh, – I was too intimidated to go up and give him love, but what an incredible yeah. writer, man. Yeah, Smithereens are fucking great. I mean, you know, they're amazing. You the, know? Best. I, the best. I got a lot to love from you know, my old friends in Jersey. Yep. Uh, anyway, but I, I love you, buddy. Thank you. Night. Sam, thanks for doing this. I'm going to let you go at 5 o'clock in a lonely place. I think Danita Sparks is next. Oh, and, uh, yes, fun. He is. From L7. Doing I'm going to keep show. We got to Pretty incredible group of people. Jesse Malin and Lizzie Hale, Linda Perry. It's nice. Really killing here at We Are Here. Squad. Putting our heart and soul into everything we do. Sam, thanks again, brother. Thanks, Much bud. Love to you. Much love Great to you, man. Doing. All right, bud.